Well, it's a pleasure to be here today. I want to thank the committee uh, for inviting me to speak. Uh, we'll plow some old ground. Uh, for those of you who are, haven't been down that road, for those of you who had, I'm sorry. Um, and for Kevin especially, uh, I want to let him know that I'm still uh, um, at, DQ, at GQ. Um, <laughs> um, but I've graduated to the overweight uh, senior division. And so <laughs> that's the best I can do. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk um, some of the uh, historical perspective of the living shorelines. I'm not going to be talking about um, bulkheads or revetments, assuming you know all that. Um, I've had to cut it a little bit short, and I guess I better get going, <laughs> um, or groins either for that matter, but we can talk about these things at a later date. I've been at VIMS for 34 years, by the way. I'm a geologist and uh, an occasional consultant. Living shorelines. Okay, um, uh, Karen covered some of this, but back in the 70s, it really was, it was marsh fringe creation. Uh, Maryland had a program back in the 80s where they funded lots of 50-50 grant programs, put in a lot of sills and, and uh, different types of living shorelines. Uh, we were involved with a, actually a research project planting grasses around the bay to see where their hydrodynamic limit would be, i.e. fetch. Uh, and I called David Burke before this and told him I was going to blame him for all this uh, activity we hear today because he really was the one that kind of put together the living shoreline moniker and put together the hybrid and the various types of uh, uh, classifications that kind of got us to where we are today. But I, I will say from my opinion, from my perspective, it's basically you want to put in marshes or beaches as opposed to hardening the coast. And as you have seen and will see, there's all kinds of ways to do that. There it is, shoreline erosion. Lots of agricultural land back in the 50s and 60s, the Soil Conservation Service was really uh, one of the things they used to do all the time was put in groins, and they seemed to work pretty good, but we're not going to get into that. Well, one thing they like to do, which was really cheap, is actually create marsh fringes. This is in the 60s and 70s. And they uh, actually came up with a, uh, a little um, table. You fill in this table, and it'll tell you where you should plant it, where you shouldn't. And oddly enough, some of the stuff at the top, things that we are important, uh, fetch, shore orientation, those types of things. So this, this idea has been around and been implemented for a number of years. Early research, Newton and uh, Woodhouse, uh, Corps of Engineers, Broom Seneca, uh, Ed Garbus did a lot of work, has done a lot and put a lot in in, um, in Maryland. Environmental Concern con continues that today. The Cape May uh, Material Center f uh, gave us a lot, uh, provided a lot of um, <clears throat> grasses to our projects. And uh, we had a little project where we tried to plant some grasses and see how it worked. I call these limiting factors, but in reality, as you look at it, they're actually design parameters. Fetch uh, is just sort of a proxy for wave climate, and you can look at the rest of them. But as we found through time, sunlight is a critical element. The little project we had, Lee Hill and the group planted marshes over a period of three or four years and monitored them. We had some vegetative information. We did this, that, and the other. And what we did is plant existing substrates. And these work pretty good in a lot of places, especially where the fetch wasn't very large. This particular site up on uh, Tabs Creek in uh, Virginia uh, was planted just to all turn a floor. And it's 24 years after construction, it's still doing a good job. Now that's, that's pretty good, that's pretty good uh, performance for a small little marsh like that. What we found at this lee site on the uh, uh, Peropatank River was we planted over and over and over again. And you'll notice the lower right, uh, that's shade, and the landowner finally got sick of that and put in a revetment. So that taught us that. So the little project kind of basically told us that if it's less than a mile fetch, you've got a pretty good probability of success. Anything above that, it really becomes a hard to do. We kind of knew how that, how that would turn out, but we had the research to back it up. Now this is the Lynn Haven River, uh, last summer actually, and what you see along a lot of the creeks and in, in the, in the tidal creeks is trees overhanging and shading out the marsh. Well, Trim trees, plant marsh is actually one way to do it, and this particular landowner did that and planted some marsh right on the existing substrate. Um, <clears throat> with time, it became evident that as you had a larger fetch, you really needed a bigger marsh. And in order to get a bigger marsh, you need to bring in some sand and make it wider. And so in order to do that, you, uh, the Maryland came up with had a, uh, their non-structural program, and they funded lots of projects for private property owners. And it's still active today, and uh, there's some of the folks that are, some of these folks are in this room today, so they have a, quite a wealth of knowledge 
about uh, marsh, uh, marsh installations and shoreline erosion. Um, I forgot to mention that's innovation number two. Innovation number one was when the uh, SCS started even planting marshes for shore erosion control. Y Island, <clears throat> I've shown this uh, more than people probably care to see, but this was what it looked, notice the top photo. Uh, putting in, increasing the marsh width with sand, putting in sand containment structures, i.e. groins, and it did well for a period of years, but without maintenance. The top slide is now, the looks like this. After 28 years, boat wake activity took care of it. It didn't have too much maintenance, and these are the kind of things that, that can happen to a site if you do not maintain them. Some of these things are still in place today, and they work pretty, good, pretty well where you have a mostly onshore or offshore wave climate. It's that front edge that gets eroded, and that's where we started getting into putting in shore parallel structures called sills. Now, I'll show you this because this sill is actually was put in along the uh, small, uh, the low upland back at the turn of the century. As uh, the land eroded behind it, this marsh started growing behind it. This is ballast stone that was put in at the turn of the century, anecdotal evidence says. And so what we have here from a performance perspective is something that's been in a pretty long time and looks like it's doing a pretty good job. That's the kind of data I'm talking about. Jefferson Patterson had uh, lots of erosion along their farmland. They put in a sill back in 1988. After 16 years, and even longer, that thing is doing a, a great job. There's a nice alternative floor in there. There's patents behind it. Um, and these are the types of systems that you'll see typically around Chesapeake Bay. Now, these things age with time. This one's held up very well. As you go down the, the river, there's other sill sites. And what you often see is you see things happen to the marsh. In the case like this, uh, the, the marsh has died for one reason or another. Now, is this a bad thing? Is it microtopography? Is it okay for the fish? Some folks like that because the fish, uh, in their minds, can now get in there and be more part of the marsh. So, these are the, or should you come in and replant it? Is that and what caused that? So that you see this on a lot of sites, and I think it, sometimes people feel that it's failed because this hasn't worked and that hadn't worked. Um, but that's part of monitoring it. That's part of the maintenance issues. Now, now, we talk about design guidelines. Maryland, when they had their program, had a um, cross-section like this. And this cross-section is a pretty good template if you want to use it just about anywhere. You basically bring your sand up to some level along the bank. You take it down on a 10 to 1 slope to about mid-tide behind the sill. Now, you can do all kinds of things with this cross-section, but it's a good template to begin your design process. Alternate floor, mid-tide to mean high. Payton's above that, and then it's how you deal with the bank. So <clears throat> I'm going to show you a few typical cross-sections we developed for Matthews County. Uh, the top one is a low sill, low bank. You have a low bank, you know you're going to get a storm that's going to overtop it, so you don't need but so much. And if it's a, a, a small fetch, the structure doesn't need but be but so big. One thing I think it's important in your design process is to find out what the 10-year storm event is. Of what the 10 year water level and the 50 year water level. And you do that by going to the FEMA reports. They're right in there. They'll tell you what it is. And there's a design parameter you should consider. As you get more and more fetch, you get more and more potential wave action, then it becomes a wave energy and a real physics problem. Now, high banks under low fetch conditions, a lot of times what you'll see is shaded trees and, a, and an undercut bank. In this case, you might be able to go in there and put in a low sill system, bring the sand up to the top, go down to 10 to 1. Sometimes uh, there's some existing marsh there already, and filling it is sometimes is acceptable, I guess, depends on how much you fill. And because uh, you, you're going to replant, you're going to recreate much more than what was there before. Once again, how, mu how much water do you have? Get a little more fetch, high banks. Um, you might have to bring the structure up. You might have to put, bring the sand up. You might have to grade the bank. These are the parameters you can look at on just about any sill project in my opinion, in the Chesapeake Bay. You either got a high bank or a low bank. And the reality is people are going to be protecting the eroding bank most of the time because that's what's threatening their infrastructure. That's where their house is, and that's where they're going to go. This is Priest Point. I think it's the Plymouth Rock of Maryland. Uh, <clears throat> it's now Navy property. This project was put in a while ago, long fetch to the... Uh, to the south of about eight miles, but you can see the components. You bring in sand, you bring in and plant your marsh, typically with that cross-section in mind. Five minutes. 
the sill. Whew, the, um, nobody likes this, no, the, the long sill was a real problem. They wanted to put in some windows. One thing when you add windows is that you let in the wave action. And sometimes you got to protect the base of that bank. And sometimes you can do it with revetment. Sometimes you can do it with cobble. So I'm going to skip through some of this because we summarize it at the end. And I, you know what this is going to look like. There you go. Now you have a sill. And now you have a sill within a larger system. And we're going to quickly slide into beaches with my two minutes that are left because I think beaches really are part and parcel to this living shoreline art, this uh, discussion. They, they occur naturally. And if you want a beach, typically on, you're going to have to bring some kind of structure in to maintain it. And so the first breakwater system was put in in uh, James River in 1985. Um, this was the beginning of the dream for the breakwaters in Virginia. This was the first Tom Bolo, and the rest is history, as they say. One of the things about breakwater systems, if you look at them through time, if they're built right and constructed right, they are very, very stable. And this is long term. This is 25, 25 years old. Oops. Some innovations were using some models to determine the base shape and these types of things. And this is an application of it up on the James River. It, we sh don't spend enough time talking about how we're going to deal with the upland, how we're going to grade the bank, and these types of things. How we're going to deal with the riparian buffer, the weak link being the beach in the middle of the embayments. It looks good, doesn't it? I'll just keep on going. You can look at it. Hill and break there. We have a breakwater. Uh, Headland database on, uh, on our, our website, which has pictures and data of all kinds of breakwater sites around Chesapeake Bay, which you can view. There's all kinds of systems that are put in, rock, sand, and plants for shore protection and habitat creation. You got to maintain them. Big storm come through, take a neck out of your bank, you fix it. We've developed, uh, because we have so many have been put in and we have a good database, we've developed some sort of design guidelines uh, like uh, the, the breakwater gap and how big the embayment might be and the, these types of relationships. And people use them even today uh, to even design windows. And they, they work, they've turned out to work pretty well. Yorktown, uh, their whole uh, economy was, was energized by this breakwater system. Breakwaters, they're everywhere. They're, they're little ones, they're big ones, but typically they need to be some stretch of shore on 500 plus feet. The individual property owner with a 100 foot lot and needs a 150 foot breakwater, it becomes problematic and he's talked to his neighbor, so he has the money. Um, this is a pro project on the Eastern shore and talking about the relationships, if you, can, if you have to maintain your relationships, and what one thing, uh, Mr. Gunn, he built this particular project. He didn't want to interrupt that sand transport that was moving down the shoreline, so he pulled, he needed to pull those breakwaters back from that conveyor belt of sand. But the relationship was a problem with the minimum beach. So what do you do? You cut into the upland and make your embayment. You, the, sometimes the landowner has to sacrifice a little bit in order to have the system that he wants. Two minutes. And that's what it looks like today. Uh, very nicely, Randolph Macon did a uh, tiger beetle study for this stretch of shoreline for the fish and wildflower. And um, the, um, he found it to be tiger beetle heaven. And so uh, we will now summarize with marshes. You start to increase fetch, you need a bigger marsh, basically speaking. But they can, do, they can be long-term shore protection with all the habitat attributes that have been discussed and looked at. Uh, there is a large data set of all kinds of marshes that have been put in over the years in Virginia, in Maryland. And to me, that data set is really the basis for when we folks go out and talk about living shorelines, they can always turn about when we know they work if they're designed and constructed properly. Beaches. We, uh, Virginia is a little more... Um, we actually have laws that protect our beaches in Virginia, and so they're, they're considered an important resource. They, they, have a, they have their own habitat issues. They have their own water quality issues, which are good. But generally speaking, uh, unless you're Virginia Beach and you have a big budget, you usually have to put some kind of structure there to maintain that system. And of course, this is best applied when it's a shore reach. Made it.